Good morning, Coach Slack here once again, continuing our readings on the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. I apologize if you've been following along about the uh, break. I spent about 10 or so days in the Holy Mountain Athos and, uh, of course, traveling to and from. Uh, so I've been gone for a couple weeks, but uh, now we will finish this reading as we are on step 30, which is the, the final step. Concerning the linking together of the Supreme Trinity among the virtues. And now, finally, after all that we have said, there remain these three that bind and secure the union of all, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, for God himself is so called. And, as far as I can make out, I see the one as a ray, the second as a light, the third as an orb, and in all one radiance and one splendor. The first can make and create all things, and the divine mercy surrounds the second and makes it immune to disappointment. The third does not fall, does not stop in its course, and allows no respite to him who is wounded by its blessed madness. He who wishes to speak about divine love undertakes to speak about God, but it is precarious to expatiate on God and may even be dangerous for the unwary. The angels know how to speak about love, and even they can only do this according to the degree of their enlightenment. God is love, so he who wishes to divine, define this tries with bleary eyes to measure the sand in the ocean. Love, by reason of its nature, is resemblance to God as far as that is possible for mortals. In its activity, it is inebriation of the soul, and by its distinctive property, it is a fountain of faith, an abyss of patience, a sea of humility. Love is essentially the banishment of every kind of contrary thought, for love thinketh no evil. Love, dispassion, and adoption are distinguished by name and name only. Just as light, fire, and flame combine to form one power, it is the same with love, dispassion, and adoption. As love wanes, fear appears, because he who has no fear is either filled with love or is dead in soul. There is nothing wrong in representing desire and fear and care and zeal and service and love for God in images borrowed from human life. Blessed is he who has obtained such love and yearning for God as a mad lover has for his beloved. Blessed is he who fears the Lord as much as men under trial fear the judge. Blessed is he who is as zealous with true zeal as well-disposed slave towards his master. Blessed is he who has become as jealous of the virtues as husbands who remain in unsleeping watch over their wives out of jealousy. Blessed is he who stands in prayer before the Lord as servants stand before a king. Blessed is he who unceasingly strives to please the Lord as others try to please men. Even a mother does not so cling to the babe at her breast as a son of love clings to the Lord at all times. He who truly loves ever keeps in his imagination the face of his beloved and there embraces it tenderly such a man can get no relief from his strong desire even in sleep even then he holds converse with his loved one so it is with bodily things and so it is with the bodiless one who was wounded with love said of himself i wonder at it i sleep because nature requires this but my heart is awake in the abundance of my love you should notice, venerable brother, that the stag, the soul, having destroyed these reptiles, longs and pants for the Lord with the fire of love as though stricken by venom. The effect of hunger is vague and indefinite, but the effect of thirst is intense and obvious to all and indicative of blazing heat. So one who yearns for God says, my soul thirst for God, the mighty, the living God. If the face of a loved one clearly and completely changes us and makes us cheerful, gay, and carefree, what will the face of the Lord not do when he makes his presence felt invisibly in a pure soul? Fear, when it is heartfelt, destroys and devours impurity. For it is said, Nail down my flesh with the fear of thee, and holy love consumes some, according to him who said, Thou hast ravished our heart, thou hast ravished our heart, but sometimes it makes others bright and joyful, for it is said, My heart hath hoped in him, and I am helped, and my flesh hath flourished again. And when the heart rejoices, the countenance is cheerful. So when the whole man is, in a manner, commingled with the love of God, then even his outward appearance in the body, as in a kind of mirror, shows the splendor of his soul. That is how the God-seer Moses was glorified. Those who have reached 
reached such an angelic state often forget about bodily food. I think that often they do not even feel any desire for it. And no wonder, for frequently a contrary desire expels the thought of food. I think that the body of those incorruptible men is not even subject to sickness any longer because it, is, because it has been rendered incorruptible. For by the flame of purity they have extinguished the flame. I think that even the food that is set before them they accept without any pleasure. For there is an underground stream that nourishes the root of a plant, and their souls too are sustained by a celestial fire. The growth of fear is the beginning of love, but a complete state of purity is the foundation of theology. He who has perfectly united his senses to God is mystically led by him to an understanding of his words. But without this union, it is difficult to speak about God. The indwelling word perfects purity and slays death by his presence, and after the slaying of death, the disciple of divine knowledge is illumined. The word of the Lord, which is from God the Father, is pure and remains so eternally. But he who has not come to know God merely speculates. Purity makes its disciple a theologian who of himself grasps the dogmas of the Trinity. He who loves the Lord has first loved his brother, because the second is a proof of the first. One who loves his neighbor can never tolerate slanderers, but rather runs from them as from a fire. He who says that he loves the Lord but is angry with his brother is like a man who dreams that he is running. The power of love is in hope, because by it we await the reward of love. Hope is a wealth of hidden riches. Hope is a treasure of a assurance of the treasure in store for us. It is rest from labors. It is the door of love. It is the annulment of despair. It is an image of what is absent. The failing of hope is the disappearance of love. Toils are bound by it. Labors depend upon it. Mercy encircles it. A monk of good hope is a slayer of despondency. With this sword he routs it. Experience of the Lord's gift engenders hope. He who is without experience remains in doubt. Anger destroys hope, because hope maketh not ashamed, but a passionate man has no grace. Love bestows pro prophecy, love yields miracles, love is an abyss of illumination, love is a fountain of fire, in the measure that it wells it up, it inflames the thirsty soul, love is the state of ang angels, love is the progress of eternity. <clears throat> Tell us, fairest of virtues, where thou feedest, feedest thy flock, where thou restest at noon, enlighten us, quench our thirst, guide us, take us by the hand, for we wish at last to soar to thee. Thou ruleth over all, and now thou hast ravished my soul. I cannot contain thy flame, so I will go forward praising thee. Thou rulest the power of the sea, and stilleth the surge of its waves, and put it to death. Thou hast humbled the proud man as the corpse of one slain. With the arm of thy power thou hast scattered thine enemies, and thou hast made thy lovers invincible. But I long to know how Jacob saw thee fixed above the ladder. Satisfy my desire, tell me, what are the means of such an ascent? What the manner, what the sum of the combination of these steps, <clears throat> which thy lover sets as an ascent to his heart? I thirst to know the number of those steps, and the time needed for the ascent. He who knows thy struggle and thy vision has told us of the guides. But he would not, or rather he could not, enlighten us any further. And this queen, or I think I might more properly say king, as if appearing to me from heaven, and as if, and as if speaking in the ear of my soul, said, Unless, beloved, you renounce your gross flesh, you cannot know my beauty. May this latter teach you the spiritual combination of the virtues. On the top of it I have established myself, as my great initiate said, and now there remain faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of all is love. Finally, a brief exhortation, summarizing all that has been said at length in this book. Ascend, brothers, ascend eagerly, and be resolved in your hearts to ascend, and hear him who says, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of our God, who makes our feet like hinds' feet, and sets us upon high places, that we might be victors with his song. Run, I beseech you, with him who said, Let us hasten until we attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of God unto a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, who, when he was baptized in the thirtieth year of his visible age, fulfilled the thirtieth step, 
in the spiritual ladder, since God is indeed love, to whom be praise, dominion, power, in whom is and was and will be the cause of all goodness throughout endless ages. Amen. And finally, there's the icon of the ladder of St. John, and below it you see the dragon of the abyss. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.